Good afternoon and welcome everyone for joining us for today's webinar on avenues for tackling corruption that enables environmental crime, organized by the International Anti-Corruption Academy and the Wildlife Justice Commission. This event will discuss the challenges and best practices. Sorry, there seems to be a problem with my... So, uh, best practices by law enforcement and investigating the nexus between environmental crime and corruption. Please note that the webinar is, uh, will be recorded and made available next week on Ayaka's webpage. We will also welcome, of course, your questions during the entire session, which you can address, address during, um, the, with the question and answer window down below. Our speakers will be happy to answer, hopefully, all of them. Uh, not to take much of your time, I'm quickly introducing the Academy to you. IACA is both an international organization and an educational institution with the aim to deliver anti-corruption education and trainings to professionals and practitioners from all over the world. We have a great range of educational activities for master degrees, executive diplomas, online training, summer academy, and uh, of course also online trainings on a regular basis. Out of this great range, I'm very happy to inform you that we are currently accepting applications for all of our master programs and also our summer academy, um, who is, uh, that is actually taking place in person this summer from 25th of June to 1st of July. And we also have scholarship opportunities for all of these programs that I mentioned. Now I would like to move on and welcome our moderator of today's webinar. Uh, Seda Mehar Sera is a money laundering reporting officer and manager of Ani Money Laundering and S Sanction Compliance at HPL Currency Exchange Pakistan. Currently, she is establishing Ani Money Laundering and Compliance Structures and enforcing compliance culture and currency exchange sector in Pakistan. She frequently speaks uh, about uh, to financial crime um, compliance community at conferences on uh, financial crime compliance, technology, and auditing. Um, she was recognized as ACAM as a lead subject matter expert and as a key content advisor for it. She's a valued author featured in many magazines discussing recent developments in AFCC arena, auditing and innovative technologies. She's also an extensive uh, experience for formulating and conducting financial crime risk management, regulatory compliance and technology consultancy and audit engagement with KPMG, US, um, Pakistan and UAE. Previously, she also worked with financial crime compliance department at Standard Chartered Bank Pakistan and UAE, where she has carried out financial crime compliance in-depth analysis and became the first female securing a uh, securing certified any money laundering specialist credential in Pakistan. Her academic achievements include also a Bachelor of Science degree in computer engineering and a Master of Business and Management degree. Sarah, it's the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good evening to everyone. I welcome you all joining us at the final edition of the series uh, of virtual uh, panel discussion co-organized by International Anti-Corruption Academy and Wildlife Justice Commission on the topic avenues for uh, tackling the corruption that enables environmental crime. Uh, I will, uh, now I will be introducing uh, the speakers. Today we have a great panel joining us on the show. Uh, Mario Admit, uh, Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice Officer, Corruption and Economic Crime Branch. From uh, She is joining us from the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Mario Admit has over 15 years of experience working on crime prevention and criminal justice issues with the particular uh, focus on anti-corruption and economic crimes. Uh, since 2007, Maria has worked in various roles within the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. Currently, uh, as a crime prevention and criminal justice officer uh, with the corruption uh, with the corruption and economic crime branch, she leads the work on uh, corruption risk assessment and management within public institutions, as well as our work on corruption related to crimes that have an impact on the environment. Prior to this position, among others, Maria was the regional anti-corruption advisor for the Pacific for 2016, uh, from 2016 till 2018. 
Before joining uh, the uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, Maria worked for the Finishing, uh, Finish Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs in Vienna and, Ar and in Arabi. Thank you, Maria, for taking our time for joining us today at the show. Uh, the next panelist we have is Stephen Cohn, uh, founder and chairman of the board, uh, National Whistleblower Center. Uh, Steve is the founding partner of the Whistleblower Law Firm of uh, Con Con and Calavinto LLP, and the chairman of the board of directors, the directors at the National Whistleblower Center. Uh, he has a represent since uh, 1984 and is widely recognized as the leading international authority on whistleblower law. His chief represents uh, whistleblowers who reported corruption in Africa, Asia, Europe, and North and South America, including the whistleblower who reported the largest money laundering uh, scheme in history, uh, the 240 billion laundered from Russia and former uh, Soviet Union to New York banks. He obtained the largest reward ever paid to an individual whistleblower who exposed illegal offshore accounts, a dollar 104 million. Steve specializes in, rep in representing whistleblowers under Foreign Corrupt uh, Practice Act, Dodd Frank, uh, Dodd -Frank IRS, uh, and uh, QTAM whistleblower laws. Most of uh, which the most of which have transnational applications. Mr. Korn is the most published author on whistleblower law, including the new whistleblower's handbook, a uh, step-by-step guide on uh, doing what's right and protecting yourself. His article, uh, Monetary Rewards for uh, Wildlife Whistleblowers, a game changer in wildlife trafficking, detection and deterrence, uh, uh, helped trigger significant interest in uh, interest protecting wildlife crime whistleblowers. Thank you so much, Steve, for taking our time for the event today. On the next uh, uh, panelist, we have uh, Sarah uh, Stoner, Director of Intelligence at uh, Wildlife Justice Commission. Sarah, after getting an honors degree in sociology and cultural studies, Sarah worked for Greater Manchester Police in the UK for six years. Uh, firstly, as an intelligence officer, where she was based in specialist uh, or operational units, such as air support and tactical command units. Uh, she later moved into an, an analytical role where she was professionally trained as a criminal intelligence analyst, uh, working at the uh, Force Intelligence Bureau, focusing on acquitted crime, and finally a short uh, deployment at the counterterrorism unit, where she worked on several live operations. Uh, she later moved to the UK Wildlife Crime Unit, where she worked on crime issues and uh, where her interest in uh, international wildlife crime led to a role with traffic based in Malaysia, uh, in Malaysia, where she directed the law enforcement support work for Southeast Asia during four years. Sarah has also authored and coordinated diverse uh, uh, reports and case studies on wildlife crime issues. Uh, Sarah joined the uh, Wildlife uh, Justice Commission in 2016 as a senior intelligence analyst and later on moved into the director of intelligence role where she uh, now heads the intelligence development unit supporting the investigations team. Thank you so much, Sarah, for giving us time to join the discussion today. Uh, here, I would like to inform that Sarah will be presenting uh, instead of handling uh, Prince Alo, uh, Senior Intelligence uh, Analyst, as Andaline uh, is on sick leave. Handling, uh, we hope you will get well soon. I hope uh, I welcome you uh, all at the virtual panel discussion uh, and taking our time from your busy schedule to put light on the solutions to control uh, corruption generated through environmental crime. Uh, now I would like to invite Maria Admit uh, to present uh, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime reports on United uh, Nations Convention Against Corruption and discuss uh, what are the challenges faced by the parties uh, when tackling the corruption that enables environmental crime and best practices to consider for fighting it. Uh, Sarah, uh, uh, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, just a second, I think. Can, um, uh, 
now I'm trying to uh, share my presentation, but now it Um, can can you maybe share my presentation? Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so uh, today I'm going to uh, share with you a brief overview of the paper that was uh, prepared by UNODC for the Conference of the States Parties to the UN Convention Against Corruption. Um, that took place last December. Um, this work was funded by Belgium and France. We are very grateful for this. And, and the report is available on UNODC website. The next slide, please. So in this paper, we are looking at the, the relationship between uh, corruption and selected crimes that affect the environment. Uh, we are also looking at the efforts that have been taken at the national and international levels to address these crimes, some key challenges and opportunities, and overall provide information on the status of implementation of, of Resolution 8-12 of the Conference of the States Parties to the UN Convention Against Corruption, which was uh, adopted 2019, and it had the same title as this document. Next slide, please. So to gather information, um, in part particular on national level efforts, uh, we submitted a questionnaire to our state's parties in early 2021. Uh, we received 48 responses, um, but unfortunately, there was some geographical unevenness of the, of the responses that we, we received, and also many of the responses were incomplete. Uh, so this does not give a full picture, but it still gave us the opportunity to, to do some analysis uh, of the responses and, and come up with some quite interesting findings. This information that we collected through the questionnaire, we then complemented by uh, undertaking some academic literature review and also, of course, through the information that we had collected through our networks of experts and ongoing work over the, over the past years. So we looked at the relationship between corruption and different types of crimes that are, are listed on this, this slide. Um, maybe before we go to the next slide, I just wanted to note that, that there is actually quite a strong international framework in place uh, on this issue. So this resolution H-12 that I, I mentioned before, it's as part of an extended list of resolutions that all call for the protection of the environment and also highlight the importance of the prevention and fight against corruption in order to protect the environment. So, for example, last summer um, at its 75th session, the UN General Assembly adopted its fifth resolution on, tra on tackling trafficking in wildlife. And, and this resolution also included considerations on anti-corruption. Um, these and other resolutions also adopted by the U, uh, UN Convention um, Against Transnational Organized Crime, its conference of parties, they further really reaffirm, reaffirm that, that corruption is a facilitator of crimes that impact the environment. And they all call upon member states and all relevant uh, parties to, to prohibit and, and prevent and count any form of corruption that facilitates these crimes. So the in, in, international framework is in place. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, well, here we can see again the, the responses that we received. So you can see that, for example, Africa, uh, we did not receive a lot, although we know that lots of is going on there. So, so just to, to put the picture again, then that what I'm pre pre presenting for you is, is a good picture, but not the full picture. Next slide, please. So the first part of the study, um, there we analyze the relationship between corruption and the different types of crime that I mentioned before. And we also included some short case studies of adjudicated cases as examples of how this relationship can look like. So, for example, there is a case from Australia. And this uh, you probably cannot see it well, but this was a case where a biosecurity official who was responsible for 
inspecting cargo and utilizing illegal importing specimen, he abused his position and in fact facilitated the illegal importation of, of rare CITES listed fish. Um, he then stole the specimens that he was just utilizing and sold them online and was sentenced to three years imprisonment for abuse of office, dealing with proceeds of crime and illegal possession of white life. Um, the other example here is from Indonesia, where a governor of one of the provinces abused his position and sold forest concessions to a paper company in, in exchange of bribes. Uh, him and other corrupt officials that, that, that were involved in this case were sentenced between 5 and 14 years uh, in prison. So just to give some snapshots, there are multiple cases that, that we are uh, quoting in the report. Next slide, please. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit on both the preventive measures and also law enforcement measures. So we can move to the next slide. When we look at the prevention, um, so some of the data that we collected was, for example, measures that had been taken at the national level uh, to prevent corruption that, that uh, facilitates crimes that affect the environment. So uh, states parties reported quite a wide range, actually, of preventive measures that they had undertaken. And we grouped those in seven broader categories. So there were initiatives um, uh, related to campaigns, um, capacity building, transparency initiatives, policy development and implementation, procedures, re reporting and research. And the most commonly reported measures, they related to transparency initiatives and the development and implementation of policies and capacity building. Let's move on to the next one. We also ask countries to, to identify main uh, prevention related challenges. Um, and complemented this with the information that we had collected throughout the years. So maybe the biggest ob uh, obstacle that was, that was identified was the lack of systematic data collection and analysis, which is desperately needing uh, for a fuller understanding of all these challenges. So, for example, information of adjudicated cases of corruption that relate to these crimes that impact the, uh, affect the environment, uh, they are not often system systemically collected at the national level. Also, specialized research and academic, re academic literature are very limited. And uh, as noted in this report, even some of the uh, recent major studies on issues related to environment and climate change, for example, including the sixth assessment of the uh, assessment report of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that was late last year uh, published, they do not include considerations related to corruption. So this is really an issue data. Um, another challenge um, was that although uh, national authorities that are mandated to manage natural resources, they may be aware of the role that corruption plays in, in enabling the criminal exploitation of these resources, but many of them have not methodology assessed and, and addressed risks of corruption in their operation. So corruption risk assessment management is still quite weak. And some other challenges you can see are listed on this slide. Let's move on. So some uh, solutions and opportunities that the states identified uh, related again to the prioritization of data collection uh, and analysis and sharing of the data. Um, countries talked about need for stronger legislative and policy frameworks, um, awareness raising, transparency is, uh, initiatives need to be strengthened. We need better reporting system, including whistleblower protection systems. Um, let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, Again, corruption risk mitigation, so addressing and mitigating corruption risks and, and strengthening uh, preventive anti-corruption measures was mentioned. Uh, capacity building, uh, coordination efforts, and, and measures related to integrity of public service. So these were some of the opportunities and solutions that countries had identified for the issues related to prevention of corruption. Um, let's move on to the next slide. So looking at the law enforcement, 
um, we looked at the convictions for corruption linked to crimes that affect the environment. So this once again really showcased the low number of financial investigations that are uh, being taken uh, related to these crimes. So in the, in the replace, uh, re, uh, replies, only 18 countries reported on adjudicated cases of corruption related to these crimes. So they referred to a total of 57 example cases. Most of these reported cases were linked to wildlife crime, forest loss and waste trafficking. In addition, we received uh, from seven countries uh, um, some information on cases of money laundering and other financial crimes uh, in the areas mostly related to wildlife crime, waste and mining. So this was a total of 13 cases. And again, some of these examples are included in the report. Um, what some countries uh, indicated is that they face difficulties in, in reporting data on these cases, uh, mainly because of the format of the de domestic databases, which, for example, stored information on corruption and, and crimes that have an impact on the environment in, the, in separate locations and, and not in one. Um, there was also issues related to collection of data, possibly at the state level, um, and it was difficult to collect them all. And some states reported also that information of such cases was simply unavailable. It, they were, it was not collected. The next slide, please. So challenges that the, the countries uh, uh, reported uh, related to, to law enforcement were uh, complexity of these crimes and difficulties that the countries faced in establishing links with corruption. So between corruption and, and the crimes that have an in, in, uh, impact on the environment. They also reported issues related to weak penalties um, lack of specialized knowledge by law enforcement authorities, but, but also in the whole criminal justice system. Um, they talked about overlapping mandates and weak interagency coordination, um, limited understanding of financial flows and the payment mechanisms behind these crimes, the crimes that have an impact on the environment, and also limited use of financial investigations. And uh, also many countries talked about citizens' fear of reporting corruption. Um, also, countries mentioned many countries mentioned that, that these issues had a low priority on their national agendas and, and therefore also insufficient funds and insufficient uh, specialized human resources were made available. And also challenges related to effective international cooperation. So the next slide, please. Um, Again, some opportunities and solutions that the countries had identified were issues related to criminalization, issues related to simplification and standard, standardization of regulations and, and processes. Uh, many countries talked about increased transparency, cooperation with the private sector, uh, measures related to reporting and whistleblower protection. Once again, this came up with nearly all uh, and every response. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Also, the increased use of financial investigation techniques um, in order to identify and, and disrupt the criminal groups involved, and, and that a lot of capacity building was needed for that. Uh, measures to ensure that legal and natural persons are both held accountable for their involvement. Uh, strengthening of interagency and international cooperation, so both at the national, regional and international level. Uh, again, specialized training and, and stronger penalties. So these were identified as some of the solutions. Next one, please. So at the end, uh, uh, just to say a few words of one uh, particular area of UNODC's work in supporting countries, that is corruption risk assessment and management. So since 2016, we are supporting a number of uh, agencies with the mandate to protect uh, wildlife, fisheries, forests, uh, to look at their systems and processes, uh, laws, policies, uh, all the systems that are in place and identify gap and weaknesses there, and then develop mitigation strategies to address these, these challenges. Um, we are using the standard uh, corruption risk assessment approach, but have tailored that to the needs of the public uh, institutions. So uh, taking into a 
account that there won't be um, unlimited financial or human resources, not necessarily unlimited political will. But the idea is to come up with the small number of priority risks that the country has both the capacity and, uh, and resources to implement. So we are working with, with a number of countries of this, and this was something that in the report was highlighted as, as one of the areas that would still require more attention. The paper also, I don't have a slide on that, but the paper also outlined work, other work undertaken by UNODC, uh, including in relation to financial investigation support, for example, also the work undertaken by other relevant intergovernmental organizations and, uh, and NGOs uh, like Wildlife Trust Commission who have a key role to play here. Um, next slide, please. So here I just had some key takeaways, but maybe one thing I, I might uh, be running out of time. So one thing to just uh, emphasize is really the importance of prevention. Uh, it is law enforcement is also extremely important, but then it is already too late. The tree has been taken, the fish has been taken, the white light has has been poached. So so really. That's why we put a lot of focus on the prevention to make sure that the crime cannot uh, happen in the first place. But I think I will leave it here and leave something for the discussions later on. So thank you so much and back to you. Uh, thank you, Maria, uh, for the presentation. Uh, here uh, we want to ask, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime is uh, facilitating corruption risk management processes. Can you give us some examples of corruption risk mitigation strategies adopted by organizations undergoing the process? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, well, these uh, processes have resulted really in, in quite many different types of institutional changes, uh, structural changes, um, strengthen accountability and transparency measures, for example. So overall, just resulted in fewer opportunities for corruption act acts to take place. But some concrete examples, um, well, nearly in all of the agencies that we have supported, the agencies have either established or strengthened some kind of a corruption prevention committee. And, and these are uh, sort of committees within the institutions to oversee the implementation of these risk mitigation plans, for, for, first of all, but also to lead in the overall anti-corruption and transparency efforts in the, in the agency. So the visibility of these topics have increased quite a bit uh, within the agencies that we have supported. Um, there have been also uh, efforts to develop codes of conduct, codes of ethics, uh, corruption prevention policy, policies, for example. Um, legislative uh, initiatives. Um, we have supported countries to implement mechanisms for complaint intakes and whistleblower mechanisms and protection mechanisms. Um, we have uh, assessed and enhanced transparency, both in procurement and HR systems and processes. Uh, supported development of revenue prediction models to assess where revenue leakages might occur. And overall, increase the transparency of processes related to permits and licenses, and 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 so on, and and uh, and also what we have undertaken in many many institutions are surveys that are covering issues like staff morale and experience of corruption and so on. So there is really a, a great and broad sort of uh, variety of of efforts undertaken, and really seen how this this. Uh, this approach helps to support the actual needs of the, the institutions assessed. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Maria, uh, for giving us very insightful presentation and response. And now, uh, moving to our next presentation uh, of uh, whistleblower provisions, I would like to invite uh, Stephen Kohn uh, to present and tell us something about uh, his uh, experiences and all. So. Uh, over to you, Stephen. Please, uh, your uh, mic is mute. Perfect. So thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to participate in this really important seminar. I also notice from some of the participants from all around the world, it's a real honor to be able to address this group. Uh, I come bringing some very good news. Transnational 
whistleblower laws have been enacted that permit whistleblowers from any country in the world to report various crimes, especially related to corruption, illegal timbering, illegal fishing, wildlife, and specifically the illegal sale of commodities, money laundering, foreign bribery, to obtain anonymity, confidentiality, and monetary rewards. These laws are in place and can be used. So one of the most important reasons that we at the National Whistleblower Center and also my law firm like to participate in these programs is that many people don't, aren't aware of these laws and in some ways they're counterintuitive to the stereotypes. I also wanna state, you know, what's it all about and why does it work? In order to detect corruption, you often need an insider. Corruption is done secretly. It's not like murder where you find a body. A good bribe, no one will ever know was paid. So law enforcement years ago realized that you need insiders. And the insider, in order to get them to induce somebody to risk their job, or maybe even their life to come forward and do the right thing, you need some form of incentive. Because if you just rely on the goodwill, it won't work. Also, by incentivizing insiders, you create the fear of detection. And the fear of detection is proven to be perhaps the most important deterrent. If someone thinks they may get caught, they won't do it. It's as simple as that. If you have examples where people are caught and get punished and whistleblowers are rewarded, it has a massive deterrent effect. And these laws need to be implemented, enforced, and carried on worldwide. And they need to target some of the worst forms of corruption. And we know that deals with the environment, with wildlife, with fisheries, with timber, with crimes that are really destroying and, and very hard to replicate. If it's just a bank fraud, collect some money later on. But if you destroy a forest, you know, it may take a little time to fix that, if ever. So let's go to the first slide of the presentation, please. And, and this PowerPoint will be distributed to everyone. I'm only picking just a couple slides to make the point. One of the most important laws is the, what's known as the Dodd-Frank Act. It has transnational application, but it covers foreign corruption and bribery, and it covers commodities, corruption in commodities trading. And we all know that that is where so much of the corruption occurs in mining, in timber, in oil. So much corruption occurs there. And, and what the commodity laws are now saying that is, if you engage in corruption related to commodities, including environmental corruption, that impacts the markets and there is jurisdiction. So this is the quote from the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission in giving a $30 million award to a non-U.S. citizen for reporting foreign corruption. And you can, speaks for itself. It makes no difference whether the claimant was a foreign national, resided overseas, information submitted overseas, misconduct occurred overseas. Transnational. So I, I make this point because it's open for everybody listening in on this seminar. Next slide, please. 
This will just show you where whistleblowers have come from. They've, they've come into the United States. We haven't colored the USA in. But these are the countries where whistleblowers are already using these laws. Thousands. I think it's like over 3,000. So anybody who says that these whistleblower laws won't work in their country, unique to United States, can't operate in a developing country, they're not telling you, giving you accurate information. This is transnational. Next slide, please. So we've just looked at countries that had the, that were known and identified as having the worst illegal fishing practices. This is how many whistleblowers have come from those countries into the transnational reward program. You can see the numbers. Next slide, please. And we did the same. We just looked at countries that were the worst in illegal logging and how many whistleblowers were coming from their countries. Next slide, please. And the same goes with wildlife trafficking. You can see how many whistleblowers are coming in. And what's amazing about these numbers is to be honest, I have no idea how these people are even learning about this law, let alone learning how to file, but they are and it's growing. Next slide, please. And this is just again, a summary of how successful the programs have been. High quality enforcement actions, flooded with quality tips. If you have a good whistleblower law, it will work. Next slide, please. To me, this is one of the most important slides that I have. It summarizes so much because there's this misunderstanding of where corruption comes from. So we've looked at the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, successful prosecutions, bringing in billions in sanctions, hundreds of cases, we've analyzed them. So the countries in black are the, where the bribes, the money is coming from to pay the bribes. You can see it's the developed world. It's Western Europe, Japan, United States, Canada. These are the countries whose businesses are corrupting the developing world. Why? They want access to timber, fish, oil, mining interests. So they will pay the bribes and those bribes are paid to get many benefits, not just the extraction of the commodity, but the extraction of the commodity at the expense of the environment. This is why our laws work so well, because we can target a French company that's paying a bribe in India, or a US company that's paying a bribe in South Africa. Get the folks who are paying the money. Next slide, please. I have also, th this is just from the Transparency International Index of the 50 top corrupt countries in the world. Now, these, I, I actually disagree with the Transparency International concept because I believe the most corrupt countries in the world are the ones from the prior slide that are paying the bribes. But regardless, this is what Transparency says are the most corrupt. Next slide, please. So all I did was we looked at the number of whistleblowers coming from the 50 most corrupt countries in the world, according to transparency, entering the program, entering the whistleblower program. And you can see this rise over time. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act whistleblower law came into effect in 2011. It was passed at 
in 2010 and really started in 2011. And you see this growth. And this slide is important because what it's telling you is that whistleblowing isn't something just in the United States or Great Britain or a developed country. You're, it's telling you that people who witness these crimes in the most corrupt nations on earth are looking for a way to expose it and to do the right thing. They there just aren't, they need a law to do it. Foreign corrupt practices, money laundering, we're developing those laws. Next slide, please. So what's the framework? And, th and this will be the last slide I go over. Why do they work? So let's start at the top confidential and anonymous reporting. So you can contact a US law enforcement agency, and be fully confidential, and an agency that has transnational powers. And we've been working with them for over 10 years now, and they really do protect the identity of the whistleblower. Second point. Obviously, retaliation is a big deal, but better yet, if nobody knows you're a whistleblower, if you really are confidential, then you don't get retaliated against. They don't know who you are. So the law is looking for the quality of information. They're looking for high quality information, which takes you to the third point. Compensation is based on the quality of the information you confidentially give to law enforcement. If that information is good enough to justify a sanction, meaning a successful enforcement action, you get between 10 to 30 percent of what the government collects. And underneath are some of the laws that currently have this reward and they're international in scope. And, and it's really Foreign Corrupt Practices, Commodity Exchange Act, and money laundering are the three that would be focused most specifically here. I just want to also say, and I, I again, I think this is counterintuitive. These laws work better than anyone ever imagined. So since the first law was passed using this model, False Claims Act, there's been over a hundred billion dollars in sanctions obtained. That means they actually got the money from the crooks. And the money from the crooks has awarded thousands of whistleblowers over $10 billion. So these are broad programs that have been around covering many types of frauds, but they work. And this, I think, is the model going forward. So that's my presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the wonderful presentation, giving us so much insightful uh, it's great to have uh, you uh, in the panel, panel discussion. Uh, now moving to our next presentation uh, about the introduction of intelligence analysis. I would like to invite Sarah Stoner to present her presentation. Sarah, the floor is yours now. Thanks, Gasper. Uh, if you could just move that on, please. So um, what we see um, in terms of wildlife trafficking has altered somewhat over the last 10 years, um, especially for, for some forms of wildlife, for illegal wildlife trade. We often um, see that that would now qualify as kind of organized crime, um, yet the response to it hasn't evolved quite as quickly um, in the meantime. So this is a map of a kind of a typical trafficking routes that we see of uh, huge shipments of uh, ivory and pangolin scales. So very kind of typical 
um, of, of the problem with that we're talking about. If you, but if you consider um, the trafficking of wildlife that's occurring at this level with this you know, amount of frequency and, and volume of products that are being moved, it must involve some level of uh, kind of coordination and sophisticated um, uh, smuggling methods that are used um, and also some level of corruption. However, what we often see is very little investment in, in investigating crime occurring at this level or looking backwards also. And that's really quite important to, to try and have an impact on the problem. So we see typically low level actors um, um, that are perhaps connected with the seizure at the point uh, or the shipment at the point of the seizure um, and very little less investigations happening beyond that. Um, lots of uh, different agencies that are not necessarily um, equipped to deal with um, high level organized crime are kind of um, mandated to, to tackle this problem, perhaps don't have the experience. And of course, um, corruption is, is um, operating uh, across every level. So we really need to start thinking a little bit more about um, applying more advanced investigative techniques. And this should be absolutely informed and guided by Intel analysis, um, which should seek to kind of make this approach a lot more proactive. Uh, next slide, please, Gaspar. So the analysis of intelligence for operational purposes is an incredible force multiplier and lends itself very well to the investigation and detection of uh, transnational organized crime, um, which continues to be one of the greatest impediments to conservation effort, efforts almost on the global scale. And, and the WJC recognized that, and uh, we've invested quite a significant amount of time and resources to enhance our understanding of uh, the, the networks, the criminal networks that are engaged in this transnational organized crime. Um, so that we can investigate those individuals um, and support law enforcement agency as best we can. And it's through the application of intelligence analysis for a number of different analytical techniques um, that we seek to target transnational organized crime. And by doing so, we seek to identify those corrupt, corrupt actors that facilitate crime happening at that level. So we work on building up insight about criminal networks, through you know, techniques such as social network analysis to build our understanding of structure and power relations within an organized crime network. And we also undertake something called subject risk assessments and that helps us to understand the level of harm posed by some of these groups. Uh, next slide, please, Gaspar. So we operate very much at the WJC using a risk-based approach and that is really um, seeks to kind of have a much greater impact on how these criminal networks um, operate from a targeting and kind of disruption point of view by understanding the power and influence, as I said. So we, what, we, what we tend to do is look at each of those individuals to understand the role that they play um, and how those individuals uh, cooperate together as part of a crime network and the composition of those networks that they are within. So next slide, please. So we have actually devised our own, what we call a subject for assessment. And the objective of this assessment is to measure the impact of each of those, sub, you know, those persons of interest that we're looking at, um, looking at their criminality based on several criteria. And that's really aims to kind of classify their roles and motivations and places them on this level of one to five, with five being the kind of, kind of highest level individual we're interested in. So we really undertake this assessment to rate risk in terms of both the criminal um, point of view and also a conservation point of view. So um, we look at the access to resources that those individuals have in terms of um, uh, what, what kind of wildlife they're able to um, access. Um, but we also look at their criminal capability. So to insist, to assist in the identification of a subject role, Within an organized crime group, we look at the level of significant harm that's created by that group's activity. Um, so we also look at things like the, you know, the amount of profits being generated from, from their particular criminality, the negative impact upon uh, conservation efforts, um, the exercise of control over an individual or commodity, um, whether it involves any kind of violence or also whether it involves any criminality, uh, corruption, sorry. So we use this um, as an internal classification which provides several benefits, you know, including it helps map us out, map out all levels of criminality. Um, it allows us to assess threat, time and risk. Um, it, us, it allows us to understand uh, much better um, the structure and focus so that we can then um, allocate our resources against that particular problem accordingly. Um, it allows us to um, assess complexity of activity and also understand geographical range of offending. Uh, next 
slide, Peter Gasper. So yeah, one of those criteria that we look at is government complicity as well. So moving on, Gasper. So we um, look at the way in which uh, that government complicity, um, if at all, is engaged by that particular individual on that network. So we rate the, that, that type of interaction on a scale of one to four. So here we have a kind of scenario. So if we, if, if we receive information that, that individual is known to be paying bribes um, or has the capacity to pay, pay bribes to some individuals at certain airports, for example, they would be scored a one. Um, and then of course we have different scenarios as we move further up the scale. Um, next slide, thank you. So the, the, this, this kind of approach allows us to be able to essentially uh, identify the way in which crime is being committed and, and how that's happening. So we, the main kind of um, objective for that is to identify those ena enabling factors, one of which corruption is a key enabling factor, of course. Um, it, it helps facilitate um, the overall uh, problem to happen in that manner. Um, so it, it is through this kind of methodical approach of using us, this subject risk assessment, we're able to then um, understand those individuals and which level they sit at in terms of um, organized crime. Yes, Sarah. Yep. It's thank all you. from inside? Yep, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah, of, um, for giving us great insightful presentation. Uh, now I would like uh, to uh, move on to the next presentation, uh, discussing how whistleblower protection can help address corruption and environmental crime. Uh, I would uh, Steve, the floor is yours now, again. Hello. Yes, Steve, can you hear me? I guess uh, your mic is mute. Oh. There I am. Okay, I'm out of mute. Yes. Um, I, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry if it was directed to me. But you're on mute now. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, the, uh, uh, we would like to know about how whistleblower protection uh, help address uh, corruption and environmental crime? Sure. So just very briefly, you need the insider. You need the person with the good evidence that can actually trigger a successful prosecution. And that always tends to be an insider. And the insider has the most to lose not just their job, obviously, or their career, but they might be in physical danger because they're closely associated with those who are engaged in the illegal activity. They have to be to learn about it. So that's why the best whistleblower practice is quite simple. Anonymity and confidentiality a honest and good law enforcement agency to report it to. <coughs> and in my view, incentivize through a reward system compensation based on successful prosecutions. You need to incentivize, you need to deter. That's the model. That's great. Uh, I have uh, one more uh, question, uh, Steve. Uh, what change would you like to see uh, that could potentially uh, 
strengthen the laws applicable to environmental whistleblowers? Uh, the biggest change I'd like to see would be a growing movement in developing countries and Europe to utilize Steve? the exist existing laws. Yes, I'm sorry. Should uh, I ask the question again? No, uh, did you, uh, what, what I would like to see, yes, would be a movement, educational and active, an active movement to more aggressively use existing laws. This is critical. NGOs can play an absolutely critical role in educating potential whistleblowers and advocating for better protections in their home countries. There needs to be a recognition that it works and therefore a motive to get it done correctly. Thank you, Steve, uh, uh, for, the, uh, for answering the question. Now moving uh, on to uh, today's uh, presentation, uh, I would like uh, Sarah uh, to tell us about how can intelligence analysis uh, can help address corruption and environmental crime. Yes, Sarah, the floor is yours now once again. Great, thank you. Um, I have a, a small a small presentation. Um, so this is more uh, a specific case study that we worked on a few years ago um, where corruption was found to be a key enabling factor. Um, if you could just go to the next slide, please, Gaspar. So this was uh, an investigation that we worked on a couple of years ago called Operation Dragon that focused very much on the trafficking of, of turtles and tortoises in Southeast Asia. Um, and although we had set out to kind of investigate those, a lot of those networks that were involved in, in, yeah, in, in this particular problem, actually what we found, um, which we didn't necessarily expect, was a huge amount of, uh, of corruption and, and that they played a really significant role. So a lot of these individuals had been tra trafficking um, huge volumes of, of these animals for a very long time and um, were practically untouchable. Um, so we, we sought to try, kind of try and change that as much as possible. So using that approach that we that I just talked about to try and identify who are those sort of key significant individuals that are enabling um, this problem to uh, continue. So we were able to gather quite a lot of um, uh, intelligence, but also uh, evidence on the inner workings of eight different trafficking networks through our undercover investigations um, and, and the application of intelligence analysis. So our investigation was able to uncover a number of kind of high level individuals um, that were taking advantage of, uh, you know, of, of um, trafficking through organized corruption at a number of different airports and transport hubs in, in Southeast Asia. So we were able to document in detail how those networks operated, um, how they fixed prices, how they coordinated across the entire supply chain. And ultimately, we were able to empower law enforcement agencies to disrupt and convict a number of those individuals. So during the two year case, we um, were able to um, uh, facilitate 30 different arrests and, and that led to the disruption of eight different trafficking networks um, and the seizure of more than 6,000 um, freshwater turtles and tortoises, including many uh, threatened species. Um, and one of the subjects was actually um, uh, put on an uh, Interpol red notice. So it was the first time that had ever been, uh, Malaysia had ever issued a red notice for anyone for wildlife crime. Uh, next slide, please, Casper. So we were able to um, expose the kind of uh, consistent corruption that was happening at a number of strategic airports. So we were able to document 59 different examples of where um, individuals were uh, using corruption um, to you know, get their products passed through different ports. So the way in which we operate, we, we um, employ, um, uh, sorry, deploy um, undercover uh, operatives who will speak to the traffickers and we, we document every conversation that we have with the traffickers here. You can see an example of, of one of that uh, part of one of the conversations. And there they, we found that they consistently would refer to what they called settings. Um, 
And that really was just where they had, you know, a corrupt or a complicit um, individual would help um, move their products through. And we were able to actually glean specific information about the co cost of that corruption at some of those ports in the region. Um, we found that for many years, Bangkok had been a really important uh, transport hub for these particular species. But actually, that changed um, over the last few years. And certainly during the, the investigation, we were able to document a little bit of displacement from Bangkok um, into Malaysia. And we felt that a lot of that was probably due to um, the fact that the cost of this corruption, that, 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 that this tax that, was, that had to be paid in Bangkok, it was actually 50% higher than the cost um, in KL, for example. So we, we imagine that was probably a huge uh, influencing factor there. Um, next slide, please, Casper. So yeah, you can see here, um, we were able to look at uh, specific um, ports in the region and we're able to you know, applied some analysis in terms of looking at specific roles um, of those particular ports um, and looking at the way in which they were being utilized along the supply chain. So we could understand where traffics were being, where they were originating from, where they were transiting through, and also where was the final destination and how frequently those seizures were occurring at particular um, airports. And this, that kind of methodology allowed us to um, apply uh, to, to see a kind of direct comparison of where seizures had happened versus where law enforcement action was happening as well. So yeah, the next slide really nicely illustrates that further. So for, directly taken from our UC conversations, those are the 59 different examples of settings that we, that we were able to document through that investigation. You can see Malaysia scores the highest. Um, and then there are a number of other countries in, in Asia um, that were, that were um, repeatedly um, cited as one of those um, areas um, where they could get products in and out. If you go to the next slide, please, Kaspar. So yeah, so through the collation of all of this information, we were able to map out where corruption was reported. So that obviously creates a much greater and clearer picture um, and a greater understanding of the fact that, uh, you know, places like KL and Colombo were being used as entry and exit points. Um, we were able to map out where products were, could be smuggled into, but not out of, such as Bangkok, and locations where entry and exit were absolutely, you know, not not uh, guaranteed, um, such as Hong Kong. So, you know, um, traffickers would often often say to you, "Yeah, you can, you know, I'll sell you the products, but you will have to move them yourself to Hong Kong, for example." So it gave us a really, you know, a lot of really valuable insight about how um, the impact of these settings as well, and that kind of safety net, and, and if that was removed, what what impact that had. Um, we also see, saw um, this kind of pattern of altering routes to safer ports, um, and that was also documented, as I said, in Malaysia, but also in, in India. So several of those persons of interest we, we monitored uh, moved their operations from India to Bangladesh because there was an increased force enforcement effort in India. And I think John, uh, sorry, Steve said, Stephen said earlier that, you know, it's all about um, fear of detection, and, and that's a really uh, crucial um, deterrent that's often uh, one of those kind of uh, risk considerations that criminals will undertake. Um, so yeah, so we, we found that, the, that they moved their, a lot of their operations to go out through Calcutta airport. And, and of course, Malaysia was that one of those entry points into Southeast Asia. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. So ultimately, uh, intelligence analysis can be incredible, incredibly valuable for using, you know, specific in kind of investigative information that's been taken from on the ground uh, work, such as uh, UC led investigation, um, intelligence investigation. Um, and we're able to amass a lot of information around that to contextualize any changes in the kind of seizure um, data, for example, and understand um, what you know, it, it's able to provide an understanding of what we know, what we don't know, and, and who is important. So effectively, it takes the approach of um, you know, if we had thirty individuals in a network that we know about, which of those thirty individuals would we want to target, and why? Of course, for being able to target thirty individuals is is not realistic in a law enforcement um, point of view. So we want to be able to, if we had the resources to tackle three or four, why would we want to target those, and um, why would their removal from the network um, be uh, be important and, and prevent that network from reorganizing itself again. So simply, you know, if one or two of those individuals are removed, are they going to be able to replace those individuals and continue to function as it always did? Um, so this approach is actually you know, really quite important for that. And that's the kind of um, impact we were able to have in Operation Dragon. 
Yeah, thank you. That's great. Uh, a very insightful, Sarah, for showing us this uh, real case study. Uh, now, uh, taking uh, up this great opportunity that we are having all the panelists, um, all the panel speakers to offer their insightful thoughts, uh, or their valuable insights. Uh, uh, would you like to react to the intervention of your fellow panel members? Yeah, if I, I could start up, if that's possible, I just want to react to what Sarah said in her great presentation about Operation Dragon and some of the insights. So obviously that was great work. And on one of the slides, you may have noticed that the origin of the crime seemed to be in India and Pakistan and the final destination was in Hong Kong. So that may appear to be an internet, like a, a localized criminal network with no tie to the United States or the developed world. In, a, in short, it may appear that our whistleblower laws have no impact. However, where do the traffickers put their money? Usually in a bank. If a trafficker uses an international bank, they may be cut, that bank most likely is covered under money laundering laws, which are now moving you into the jurisdiction of the United States. Why would a money laundering law be implicated? Well, first, they're gonna lie about where they got the money from. Bingo, that's the crime has already been committed. It's now a banking crime. The bank is supposed to have controls to monitor this. So all of a sudden the bank may become liable. The bank is supposed to monitor what's known as politically sensitive persons, especially government officials that might be putting money into accounts. Also, you may have heard of the concept of hiding beneficial ownership, which is the, the key to money laundering. People lie about whose money it is, and they set up phony LLPs, etc. Also, many of these trafficking networks are involved in other types of criminal enterprises. So it may not just be money going into a bank from, say, trafficking in certain species. It could be other types of crimes too, drugs, you know, human trafficking, et cetera, because they often, these networks are, have multiple corruption. So therefore you can target the bank and the bank can seize all the assets, which should have happened to begin with. So what I'm saying is in terms of education, this is the, the kind of the new thinking that has to be engaged in. You can see the crime in front of you, but then try to figure out how that crime may implicate other institutions that if they were functioning correctly and lawfully offer whistleblower protections, monetary rewards, and also the way to really clobber some of these networks take their money. So th that's what I'm saying. It's just a way I'm not, and I'm not saying whether Operation Dragon, this would have even been applicable. All I'm saying is it's a way to think about all forms of corruption, including trafficking. Well, maybe I also uh, just uh, just a brief comment. I, I found both presentations just fascinating. Thank you so much, and and just congratulations for both organizations for fantastic work that that you are doing. Um, and I also think that this really once again sort of um, really underscored the findings of the study that I, I I talked to you before both of these. First of all, one of the issues that all the countries, nearly all the countries reported us was really the fear to to report on these cases 
uh, by the the insider, so people who are working in the in the agencies, also by the by the public, and uh, and what Stephen was was really outlining how important it is to have the anonymity, confidentiality, honest and good law enforcement agencies. Unfortunately, not the reality in in many countries, but we really need to to drive towards that because that is really a key. Um, and also what Sarah mentioned before about. Uh, one of the main outcomes uh, and, and that it is quite clear that in, in many of these cases how corruption really facilitates them. And still, you know, we have more and more seizures. We have some big seizures. There are more and more investigations into, into wildlife forest crimes, but yet the, the financial investigations still remain very limited. So I think this is something that the international community, all the countries have to invest to build capacities on this do the work, similar work that the Wildlife Justice Commission has done here. I mean, this is really one of the, the masterpieces also in terms of, of getting the data and, and analyzing the data, what I what I talked about before also, what is very important. So so just um, thank you for the presentations and and uh, very complimentary, I think, to, to each other. Thank you. And, and I just want to just throw something out at that also, and I agree totally, fantastic presentations. Uh, just one other potential benefit for increasing investment in enforcement is the ability to collect fines. Uh, a lot of our laws have really you know, maximized criminal pen and civil penalties, making them as large as possible. And then they, some of the laws permit the money that is collected in these fines to be reinvested in anti-corruption efforts, to be paid to victims, which in an environmental crime, it could be figured out. So by marrying an a strict enforcement law with high penalties, with a whistleblower law to incentivize sources and make the enforcement possible. And then with a concept known as restitution, where the monies obtained from the successful prosecutions are reinvested in, anti, in building anti-corruption, building conservation. That's really the future model we're doing it in some of our laws in the United States. It's still at the beginning phase, but this I think is a road forward to make anti-corruption profitable. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Do you want to contribute to that? Yeah, sure. Or? I was just going to say that one of the things, of course, that, you know, I obviously presented on how great intelligence analysis is, and of course it is great, <laughs> and I would say that, but I think it's, you know, we need to be sort of realistic about how incredibly difficult it is to do, you know, a good intelligence uh, analysis um, with really poor data. Um, and that's something that we are really still seeing, you know, there's not enough information collection going on, there's not enough information sharing going on. I know Maria sort of alluded to that. And then of course, even talked about the fact that, you know, whistleblower uh, um, and the huge ben benefit that can offer as well from an intelligence point of view. Um, we, we recently undertook an analysis of um, crime convergence, so that's wildlife crime that have converged with other forms of serious and organized crime and, and, and of course corruption was present in almost every case that we looked at. But what we see generally is that there's a huge, you know, there's a huge lack of information sharing across different agencies that are mandated to work on those different forms of serious and organized crime and of course that results in lots of missed intelligence opportunities. That means resources are not being um, allocated appropriately in response to the, the current threat. Um, so, you know, it's fine to say that, an, um, you know, analysis is a great end result, but that's, there's a lot that needs to happen before that. And that's, you know, often part of a lot of the, a lot of the problem is the fact that there isn't enough good information out there um, to sort of facilitate analysis in the first place. Um, and Sarah, if I just respond to that, First of all, I couldn't agree more. The lack of sharing of, uh, you know, 
this is what I do all day. I work with whistleblowers and law enforcement and we attend meetings and all of that. And the lack of sharing of information is beyond all comprehension. Like why does anyone really care? The lack of resources, the, the failure of governments to commit the resources to these programs, to anti-corruption. So even in the United States, believe it or not, in our Dodd-Frank Act, 65,000 whistleblowers have entered the program and they've probably concluded about 500 cases. I mean, the amount of intelligence that can come in, but yet the lack of resources dedicated to enforcement. And what I'm trying to point out as much as I can is that enforcement can be profitable. In other words, especially, you know, if you do a good job, you can, it, it can be profitable. Uh, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the, the, the law enforcement agency that controls commodities with a tremendous amount of fraud. Last year, they brought in a billion dollars in sanctions, a billion dollars in sanctions. Their entire operating budget was three hundred million. Their whole operating budget, that, and not just for enforcement, for everything they do, 300 million. Yet their enforcement people brought in a billion. Yet they have no program to reinvest any of that billion into more enforcement, anti-corruption, or even payment to victims. So these programs can really work, but they're, and, and this is United States, we all know what it's like once you go into the developing world or even Europe, they, they don't dedicate the resources or the training. They don't dedicate what is necessary for really effective anti-corruption programs, judges, prosecutors, better laws. We have our work to do, but what I'm trying to say is, but by looking at the successful programs, it gives us a vision to go forward on because there's a lot of stuff that would make people depressed. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, uh, honestly speaking, uh, that it's recalling me my time when I started my career as an analyst. As uh, identification, I used to find it's the most important point, identifying and then proving the case and putting it on the table uh, to report to uh, FIU. So it's truly a wonderful presentation from everyone of you. Now uh, we will be opening floor for a question and answer session. So uh, quickly, we are going to have uh, some question. Um, one question, uh, Chris is asking for Steve, uh, Steve, can a whistleblower uh, with information relating to his or her government's involvement in environmental crime can be relocated outside that country? It's very difficult. Let's just put it that way. The answer is yes. And we have cases in the United States where whistleblowers have gotten political asylum. But I also know within working with international whistleblowers, that is very difficult. It's unfortunate, but it's very difficult. Okay. Uh, the next question is, I guess, uh, is relating to the Wildlife Justice Commission. Uh, wildlife, by definition, is uh, flora, which means both franchises and forestry are part uh, and parcel of wildlife. Uh, why did you find it necessary to have wildlife, forestry, and French, uh, fisheries as uh, three separate categories in the study, uh, asked by Taya? I, I guess that is that is possible for me, um, so I, I'm happy to take this. Um, well, when we look at when we look at the corruption elements, you are absolutely right. Uh, you know, wildlife is is flora and fauna. But when we look at corruption, um, it um, it looks a bit different in when you look at the at, at these different types of crimes. So so for the wildlife crime, it is somehow quite quite clear and and 
often it is quite clear if the if these products are le illegal or legal. But when we talk about fisheries, for example, if the corruption happens at the <clears throat> very early stage, let's say you know when when the licenses are giving out or so on, then the fish that is entering the the value chain actually looks legal uh, all the way through. So first of all, these are the two different elements that, that have to be taken into consideration and, and why the corruption maybe looks a bit different related to wildlife and fisheries crime. And then even more different when we talk about, talk about forests, they're, they're in terms of, of resource extraction, timber is actually quite unique. Because if we talk, look, at, look at these other illegal activities, um, they don't really leave any valuable resources behind. If if the elephant is poached, the elephant is gone. Or if we take the fish, the fish is gone. But if we take the timber, then sometimes and often there is actually something that is even more valuable than the timber itself, which is the cleared land. So sometimes uh, then timber itself can be sort of secondary activity. And the main is 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 actually seeking to access land. So therefore, in, in that, that case, we have to really look what are the drivers behind deforestation and degradation. So it is, of course, timber logging, but it is also agriculture. It is uh, mining, infrastructure development, um, urban extension, these kind of issues. And, and that's why then again, corruption might, look, might, might happen way behind, uh, before, years and years and years before, and make everything again look, everything else look legal. So that's why, why the approach to corruption is a bit different when we look at these different types of crimes. And that's why we found it also important to, to keep them separate in this study. I hope this, this answers the question. That's, that's great, Maria. Uh, now moving on to the uh, next uh, question. It's uh, uh, mentioned by Bonnie. Uh, Steve, I guess it's for you again uh, regarding a wildlife crime. Uh, Bonnie is asking what evidence uh, of the crime is necessary for you to take a case? Uh, what information do you need? Sure. So the, the evidence has to be the evidence of an underlying crime. So, but what I say is you have to almost be imaginative. Like the example just given about deforestation. So let's assume a bribe was paid to get a permit to do this illegal logging. And that bribe was paid eight years ago and it was only $5,000. Under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, you can trace from that bribe all the way to the end and cover the whole crime. And under foreign corrupt practices, there's a concept known as disgorgement. This is for the penalty. So the company, the Western company, say the logging company, the mining company that had some intermediary pay the bribe, they have to give up all the profits they made, which can be, that's why some of those cases Although the bribe was maybe 50,000 bucks, the penalty is $400 million. So the law is constructed in a way that if it's utilized, it can be highly effective. So that's what I'm saying. So for Bonnie, see where the origin is. See if you can find some form of corruption that you can put your arms around, be it money laundering, bribery, uh, commodities manipulation. Unfortunately, we are in the business of putting like a circle in a square. We're trying, when we see an environmental type crime, we're trying to figure out an anti-corruption law that can get married to it. At some point, the laws will get better and we won't have to struggle. But it, I'm just what I'm saying is and why I think education is so important is a lot of these crimes, they just don't come to people's minds immediately. They don't think of it that way. They see the destroyed forest, but they don't see the permit from seven years before. Exactly. You're absolutely right, Steve. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll take one last question. Uh, 
uh, thing. It's again from the Steve. Uh, Lies is asking, super interesting. Thanks a lot. And uh, there are several studies from American and international association that show how tips are an essential source in tackling corruption. It would be interesting to have uh, your views on how the U.S. managed to achieve these uh, results in whistleblowing management, ensuring uh, anonymity, uh, whistleblower protection, etc. Since we know uh, uh, what would benefit if uh, the country, if other countries had successful whistleblowing mechanism, or uh, what do you think the U.S. succeed so much? Uh, what steps could be mimicked by other countries? It's a great question, I guess. Uh, Sure. So other countries yeah. should mimic what the United States did. Unfortunately, they have not. I think there's tremendous political pressure. But let's. But the question, which is a fantastic question, is why? So in 1986, our first, what I call these modernized whistleblower laws was passed, a law that would give the whistleblower 15 to 30 percent of the collected sanction. And it had a week confidentiality provision, but it had one. And nobody knew what would happen. This law was just passed. Within 10 years, it became the number one fraud law in the United States. They were collecting more sanctions, more successful prosecutions than any other law. So people were like, holy Toledo incentivizing and rewarding and protecting these whistleblowers work. So you had the Attorney General of the United States saying, most successful. Therefore, it went from false claims to tax, to commodities, to foreign corruption, most recently money laundering, because it worked in practice. Nobody knew whether it would or wouldn't, but it did. So we've had this 35 year development. Unfortunately, we have tried so hard to try to push this concept for other countries to adapt. And we just haven't had much luck. So we're really still pushing the US programs. And I just wish other countries and international institutions would just look at what the United States has done and duplicate it. They can, they just, haven't. So, so, uh, uh, now we will be ending up uh, our session, uh, today's session. Uh, now, thank you so much, everyone, for giving us uh, time and joining uh, the show. Um, as uh, we all know that environmental crime is an illegal act that directly harms both humans and the environment. Uh, this forum has given us a fantastic opportunity to look for avenues from different angles to counter corruption that enabled uh, through environmental crime. We have a great combination of panelists discuss how the uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime has addressed the issue of environmental crime and corruption. And what are the provisions for a whistleblower from legal and aspects presented by a National Whistleblower Center? And uh, last but not the least, what are the challenges faced during environmental crime and its linked corruption cases, intelligence, and investigation processes presented by Wildlife Justice Commission. I thank you all the panelists uh, for their very insightful uh, discussion and inputs. And thank you uh, to all the audience joined us today and make this event a great success. Uh, lastly, thank you uh, International Anti-Corruption Academy and Wildlife Justice Commission for organizing this wonderful event. Uh, thank you so much. Um, have a great evening and afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great day. Have a great day.